Too many people in the church identify with the broken Peter that denied Jesus three times instead of the empowered Peter that stepped out on the day of Pentecost and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do you see yourself? You are not who you were. You are born again, blood bought, a royal priesthood, a chosen people who were called out of darkness into a marvelous light. We need to quit living, identifying with our brokenness and start identifying with our wholeness that's in Christ Jesus. I no longer identify with who I was, but I am in complete identification through the blood of Jesus Christ as a new person. It's no longer I that live, but Christ in me. Uh, in 2 Timothy, Paul, he gives what we call a charge to Timothy. He instructs him to faithfully proclaim the gospel message regardless of circumstances, regardless of what's going on around him, regardless of what's happening. He calls him to faithfully proclaim the gospel, no matter whether he's up, down, no matter the situation. So as you're turning with me to 2 Timothy, we're going to be in chapter 4 uh, this morning. And I'm going to read a little bit of what Paul said to him. And then we're going to look at the words of Christ as well this morning. But Paul says this to begin. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which... The Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You know, I, I like so much of what's in here, but even that last part there, I want everyone in this room to understand something, that all those who have loved his appearing, when he comes to receive us, you are going to receive a crown of righteousness. If you can stand there and say, I have fought the good fight, I have endured and stood firm in my faith, and now I'm with the Lord. Now we know we're going to lay those back at his feet <laughs> because we are not worthy. Only one is worthy to wear a crown. But nonetheless, there is a prize that's greater than anything you could lay your hands on on this earth. There's no car, there's no house, there's no, there's no job, there's no amount of money, there's no relationship, there's no amount of kids. Then All those are good things, and they bring joy to our life in certain areas and certain times. But none of them compare to that moment where you will stand before Jesus himself, and he will look at you and say, Job well done thy good and faithful servant. Nothing compares to that moment. I believe that's why Paul, when he said, uh, he said, our present sufferings do not compare to our future glory in Christ Jesus. And so we see these words that Paul wrote to Timothy, but I, I want to look at another time where people were commissioned, and that's in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus, he commissions the 12 disciples to go out and preach the gospel. But then in Luke chapter 10, he gathers the 72 to him. These were not the 12 disciples, but these were 
men and women who followed him as disciples that served. And so these 72 people, he stands before them in Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, and he says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead. Two by two. Hold on, I'm flipping over here. I was reading off my note on my phone, it's too small. It is what it is. <laughs> so let's start over. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord, pointed, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Now, he goes on to tell them not to take anything with them, uh, you know, not to take money, not to take, not to take extra things. And he tells them that if they go into a town and they're received to stay there and do the ministry, but if they go into a place and they're not received to, to leave, to dust, dust off their feet and to go to the next place. So he gives them further instructions. But what I want to focus on just here for just a minute is two things that Jesus spoke that I want to speak to every one of us. The first one is the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvest is ripe. It's ready. What does that mean? It means that there are millions and billions of lost souls out there that are ready for someone to share the gospel with them. They are ready for someone to tell them about the love of Christ. They are ready for someone to come along and say, do you know Jesus? The harvest is is ripe, but the laborers are few. And, and I think that that should bring, you know, God is not a God of condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, but I think as a church, as the body of Christ, we should feel a little bit of angst when we read something like this that says, listen, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I think for us that live here in Lawrence, when we see the statistics that say there's 100,000 people in our city and less than 5% of them are born-again believers. Why are there so many lost in our city? You want to know the truth? Because they're so few laborers the majority of people do not take the gospel message outside of these four walls in their life they think it's the job of the pastor or the church to reach everybody all the while they forget that there is no church without you because we are the church The gathering we have on Sunday isn't the church. This is a gathering of believers, unbelievers, people that came to, to for different reasons and purposes. But this isn't the church. The gathering isn't the church. The church is the body of Christ. And so we need to be able to take the message of Christ outside of these four walls, guys. Come on. It's an indictment on the church that there's so many lost people around us. If you work at a job and you have not told someone about the love of Christ, I challenge you today to check yourself with the Lord. Why haven't you? Why haven't you? You, you want to know the truth? Of why most people, unfortunately, don't share the gospel in their workplace. Because they just try to blend in. They just try to blend in and not be too different. 
And some blend in so well, they actually live in compromise in their life. I'm just going to keep it 100. The other truth that Jesus says here very quickly that I want to show you is, he says, I am sending you out as a lamb in the midst of wolves. So even though I'm telling you that there is a, a world out there that is lost that just these labors, it's not an easy world to go into. It's not an easy world to go into. There are wolves out there. there, there there's, there's demonic forces that are at work. There's, there's religious people that will rebuke you and come against you. There's people who are misled and deceived that, that practice forms of types of uh, witchcraft and dealing with spiritual elements. There's all this in the world, and he says, I'm sending you out as lambs. And, 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 but, the, but the truth of the matter is, is if we understand the power, the power of what Jesus is saying, because what was Jesus? The spotless lamb that was resurrected. Come on. There's power. We're not powerless to get out there and do this thing. Are you with me? So I want to go back to Paul's charge here for just a second. And I want to share four things with you uh, briefly this morning. I want to share four things with you briefly this morning. These are key points to Paul's charge to Timothy. Hold on, let me pull up my notes. I thought I had them back there where I could see them. On the big screen. <laughs> Okay, four key points to Paul's charge to Timothy. Number one, boldly proclaim the gospel. Boldly proclaim the gospel. I speak that to you guys sitting here in front of me. Boldly proclaim the gospel. Do not shy away from sharing the truth of the Christian message even when it's difficult. Even when it's not easy, even when everybody's not a fan, even in every even when everybody isn't in love with you, even when even when people around you are living like the devil, and you're like, man, I don't know if I want to be the guy that they look at and say, oh, there's that Christian. Come on, you better want to be the person that says, I'm the Christian. Because the Bible tells us that if you're ashamed of him in front of people, he will be ashamed of you on that day in front of the Father. Come on, do we in the church in America understand the truth of the words of Christ? When he said, if you are ashamed of me here now, So if we're standing up and saying, I don't want to be seen as the Christian. That is sinful. And you need God to do something inside of you. To set you ablaze with the love of Christ that you once knew. Because you've become lukewarm in your Christianity. What does the Bible tell us? To be either be hot or to be cold. But to be lukewarm is like being vomit out of the Lord's mouth. And somehow we become such professional Christians that we forget the truth of these words. We're so churched in America. That we don't take the gravity of what he is saying to heart. You're like, man, pastor, you're being kind of tough. This is like four weeks in a row. You're being hard on us. I, I, I told you, there's an urgency, I believe, in the spirit that the return of the Lord is very imminent. 
And, and all of you standing here in front of me, you need to know very truthfully what I'm about to say. That I will give an account one day for how I handled what I was entrusted with as a pastor and a preacher. And so, so guess what? That means if God says, you're going to be a little tough for the next four weeks, then I'm going to be a little tough for the next four weeks. Because I'd rather deal with you being a little bit upset with me than having a, my God upset with me. Okay? I'm just going to keep it real for a minute. We can work it out. <laughs> I'd rather have to work it out with you than get whipped by God. I'm just going to tell you. Boldly proclaim the gospel. So rather than just read that verse to you, I'm boldly proclaiming the gospel this morning. There's only one way to heaven. And that's through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ do you get access to a relationship to be reconciled to the Father. Only way. Your mom and dad's religion, the church you went to as a kid, all those things, none of those are sufficient for salvation. But only a moment where you recognize the truth of he, he, who He is and you surrender yourself completely and wholly to Him and ask Him to come be Lord of your life. And you don't just say a prayer, but you truly surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Then will you be saved. Number two, he says, be prepared at all times. That's what he told us. Be prepared at all times. Be ready to teach and defend the faith whenever opportunity arises. Come on, you got to be instant in season and out of season. That's what he tells us. Instant in season and out of season. In other words, be prepared at all times. Ready to teach and defend. A lot of people don't like the word defend. A lot of preachers don't even like that word. But, but what does is, what is Jude tell us? He says, to contend earnestly for the faith. That we've been entrusted with these truths. So he tells us that the saints have been entrusted with the truth of the gospel. And we must contend earnestly for the faith. I'm not saying argue with people. But what I am saying is, if an opportunity arises and Jesus is challenged in your midst, we need to defend the faith. Not saying get in useless conversations over non-essential doctrines. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the gospel. If someone tries to persuade you or change your mind, or present another gospel. We must stand up in that moment and defend the faith. And say, no, 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 no. That's not how it is, my friend. Number three, this one we don't do a lot in the church. It's kind of interesting. But he literally tells him to do this. Correct false teaching. As a minister of the gospel, correct false teaching. He says, reprove and rebuke those who spread incorrect doctrines. Now, now, if you'll notice, I don't stand up here and call people out by name. But I very much correct erroneous doctrine that's floating around the body of Christ in my preaching. And I believe that's what he's telling him to do. Is to, is to not let his people be led astray by erroneous doctrines that are out there. And so time to time, you'll hear me call out erroneous doctrines and say, no, 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 that's not it, church. Why? Because that's part of our role. Because we are protectors, preservers of the truth especially as ministers of the gospel. I, I'm going to be real honest. By and large, the church 
is way, 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 way too pacifist. Way too pacifist. Too many people in the church, listen to me. If you're watching online, look, look at me. I'm going to look at this camera for a minute. Too many people in the church identify with the broken Peter that denied Jesus three times instead of the empowered Peter that stepped out on the day of Pentecost and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have too many people in the church that identify with the, the, the tax collector and the physician and the fisherman. In other words, you're identifying with the broken part, the pre-Jesus part of who you are instead of the born-again, spirit-empowered believer. How do you see yourself? Those 12 men, they walked into the upper room as disciples that had walked with Christ. And they stepped out of that upper room after the day of Pentecost. After the Holy Spirit fell upon them. They stepped out of that upper room as the apostles of the church. Come on. I want you to know something. When you ask the Lord into your heart, you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and baptizes you, you receive boldness to proclaim the gospel. You are not who you were. You are born again, blood bought, a royal priesthood, a chosen people who were called out of darkness into a marvelous light. We need to quit living, identifying with our brokenness and start identifying with our wholeness that's in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying there's not valley moments. I'm not saying there's not moments where we go through some suffering. I'm not saying there's not moments where the enemy comes in like a flood and tries to remind you of your brokenness. But I want you to know something. I no longer identify with who I was. But I am in complete identification through the blood of Jesus Christ as a new person. It's no longer I that live, but Christ in me. I'm dead to the old man, and I have become new in him. So why would I live like the old man? Too many in the church are struggling with an identity crisis spiritually, and you need to wake up and live within the power of of the gospel that saved you, delivered you, healed you, set you free. Come on. Mm -hmm. This suit got me wanting to go old school. <laughs> Preach some of that old time religion. Come on. <laughs> if I had a tie on, it'd be over with. <laughs> Actually, if I had a tie on, I'd be loosening it and the button would come off. Come on. I'd start swirling this jacket around, slapping people with it. Come on. Come on. I do need that, really, for real. I forgot to bring that up here. Up here sweating. Come on. I'm going to tell you what, if it hadn't been for church like that, this sinner might not have found Jesus. We can do all the cute, modern, new stuff like that, but it's the same blood. It's the same power. Come on. We need a little bit of that old school. Because I'm going to tell you one big difference. Now, all the man-made traditions and all that of the old school, they can keep it. They can keep it. We don't need all that. But I'm going to tell you what the old school had that this new school doesn't. 
And that's the power. Some saints that knew how to travail with somebody. That knew how to push through with somebody. That knew how to, how to tarry in an altar with somebody till they got free. Come on, we need some of that. We need some of that old time religion. Come on. We need some of that gospel power in the church. Hallelujah. I said four, but it's five things. <laughs> and I'm almost done. What does it mean when a preacher says he's closing? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> False hope. <laughs> I really am almost done. Number four, teach with patience. Be persistent in understanding when instructing others. You know, I'm up here, I'm fiery, I'm preaching, I'm boom. You got, I mean, you see who I am tonight. I mean, I'm like this almost every week in different subjects. I mean, I'm, I'm going to get with it. I'm going to preach, and I'm going to be passionate, I'm going to be bold. And, uh, but you know what? I, I judge no one. Those of you who have had time with me outside of this pulpit would all say, he's patient with me. He's patient with me. He's understanding with me. My wife's nodding her head differently, but... <laughs> Because even though I proclaim boldly, I understand we're all at different places in our life. I'm trying to call you higher. I'm preaching so that you'll come up. I'm not, I'm not coming down to where you are to make your circumstances okay. I'll come where you are and set with you in your circumstances, but I'm going to preach you higher. Okay? That's the difference. I'll be patient with you, but I'm pulling you at the same time. To come up. Come on. Teach with patience. Understand who you're dealing with. Not everybody's at the same place in their walk with God. Not everybody's at the same place with their walk with God. And lastly, live a godly life. So he, tells, he says, live a godly life. Model Christian behavior that reinforces the message you preach. I'm going to say that again. Model godly behavior that reinforces the message that you preach. Come on. Live a godly life. I really want to dig into this, but I don't have time this morning. We might have to talk about this a little bit next week. But live a godly life. Listen, there is a standard that we must keep. And I will be the first to admit I have failed to keep that standard at times in my life. I'm not going to stand up here and pretend to preach a holier-than-thou message that says, oh, do everything that I do. I'm so holy and yada, yada, yada. I'm not even going to pretend to be that in front of you. I make mistakes. I've messed up. I've made some big mistakes. I I've done things even as, a, as a, a minister that I wish I could take back that weren't the best versions of me. But you know what I've learned in all those moments? I learned the words of Paul ring very true. One thing I have learned is I do not look back, but I press on. But I press on to the prize of the high calling of Christ that's in me. Paul said, I don't know why I do the things I do. I don't know why I, my, my spirit says do this and my flesh says this. I don't know why. Why do I indulge sometimes? Why do I mess up sometimes, Paul is saying. It's like, I don't know why I do the things I do sometimes. He says, but one thing I've learned, don't look back. Because when you look back, you're trapped. How many of you guys said, I've lived trapped before? Yeah. We all have. Come on, the traps are behind you. 
The gospel's in front of you. The cross is before you. Come on. A meeting in the air for some of us is in front of us. For some of us, we'll go to be with the Lord before that day. But that's what's in front of us. Behind me is the traps of life. Come on. So I stand here today and I say, live a godly life. Hold to a standard in your life. And when you mess up, get on your knees before the Lord. Say, forgive me. Forgive me. Repent. Repent means to turn away from. So, so, so I say this. Never run away from God. Always run to God. Even in your frailty, in your weakness, in your humanity, in your mistakes, in your brokenness, in the moments you failed, never run away from God, but always run to God. Because in God's embrace is the forgiveness and the love that you need to press on. Live a godly life, guys. Do your best to present yourselves. In other words, wake up every day. Say, God, how can my life today give you glory? And when those moments come and in your humanity you fail, you don't let the sun set. Or I would say don't go to bed. in that failure. But take a moment and give it to the Lord. You know, we don't teach this as much anymore, but when I was taught as a kid, you know, uh, you know, the now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before, that's kind of morbid. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul he takes. That's kind of like a scary bedtime story, a little bit. <laughs> what do you think about it? But 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 listen. Or 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 you're taught first first thing when you get up in the morning to give God praise, and many people they pray the Lord's Prayer. Give me this day my daily bread. Forgive me my trespasses that I might forgive others. So, so those things can seem very routine in our life. But there's some truth in the message of starting your day saying, direct my past, O oh Lord, that I might give you glory through the way I live my life. And then before you go to bed at night, have a recognition that in your humanity, you probably fell short somewhere. And before you go to bed... Say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Show me where my heart didn't represent you today. Man, we brush our teeth every day, hopefully. <laughs> you brush your hair. Some of you polish your head. <laughs> 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 we have all these routines but yet sometimes we're like man I just don't have the time to pray man how hard is it to give God a little recognition first thing in the morning and at night before you go to bed it's not that hard guys come on live a godly life amen amen